This is Andrew Wise. In lesson six in my series about English language for singers, we're going to look at the mid-Atlantic accent. Before we start, I'd like to express my thanks to Kevin Stroud. He writes and presents a podcast called The History of English Podcast, which recently devoted an entire episode to the rise and fall of the classic movie accent. My lesson is basically a very shortened version of his work. Now to the mid-Atlantic accent. This is the name given to the way American actors and actresses were trained to speak in the first few decades of the talking pictures. First, let's listen to an extract from the film Little Women, released in 1933. You're old enough now to leave off boyish tricks and behave better, Josephine. Now you're so tall and turn up your hair, you must remember you're almost a young lady. No, I'm not. And if turning up my hair makes me so, I'll wear it down until I'm a hundred. Joe. As for you, Amy, your absurd words are as bad as Joe's slang. Your airs are funny now, but you'll grow into an affected little goose unless you take care. Well, if Joe's a tomboy and Amy's a goose, what am I, please? You're a dear and nothing else. We're, we're three ungrateful wretches who don't deserve you. Oh, wait until I become a famous author and make my fortune. Then we'll all ride in fine carriages, dressed like Flo King, snubbing Amy's friends and, and telling on Marge to go to the Dickens. In this extract, you've just heard four American actresses, born in the U.S. of A., recorded in the U.S. of A., playing American characters and set in the U.S. of A., in the movie Little Women, the role of Joe was played by Catherine Hepburn, Amy by Joan Bennett, Beth by Jean Parker, and Meg by Frances D. All four are American actresses. So, why are they speaking in British accents? Well, their accents are not really British. They're based on a conception of what might once have been British. These accents were in the 30s and 40s of the 20th century regarded as cultivated and were the result of elocution training. The accent blended standard American English and the accent used in southern England and known as RP, or Received Pronunciation. Because it seemed to be somewhere between Britain and America, it became known as the Mid-Atlantic Accent. The evolution of cultivated American English has a long history, which we won't go into here. If you're interested, do subscribe to Kevin Stroud's podcast. The accent evolved from the accent of the upper classes. So what makes it sound upper class? Well, we saw already in lesson one of my series that the main issue here is the pronunciation of the letter R. This is known as roticity. The division between rhotic and non-rhotic accents came to define the class divide in the US of A. Here are recordings of two American presidents. First, William McKinley, who was president from 1897 to 1901 and came from an upper class background. Our fellow citizens, great statistics indicate that this country is in a state of unexampled prosperity. The figures show that we are furnishing profitable employment to the millions of working men throughout the United States. Our capacity to produce has developed so enormously and our products have so multiplied that the problem of more markets requires our urgent and immediate attention. We must encourage our merchant marines. We must have more ships. They must be under the American flag, built, manned, and owned by Americans. These will not only be profitable in a commercial sense, they will be messengers of peace wherever they go. Now, William Howard Taft, who was president from 1909 to 1913, and who came from a working-class background. Who are the people? They are not alone, the unfortunate and the weak. They are the weak and the strong, the poor and the rich, and the many who are neither. The wage earner and the capitalist, the farmer and the professional man, the merchant and the manufacturer, the storekeeper and the clerk, the railroad manager and the employee. They all make up the people, and they all contribute. 
to the running of the government, and they have not any of them given into the hands of anyone the mandate to speak for them as peculiarly the people's representative. As you can hear, non-rhotic McKinley drops the R sound after a vowel, but flips the R before vowels. Taft is a rhotic speaker. His accent sounds more familiar, more everyday to our ears. Kinley's way of speaking sounds similar to the movie clip we heard earlier from Little Women, and which we now call Mid-Atlantic. Mid-Atlantic was codified by the Australian linguist William H. Tilly, who developed elocution rules which were taken up by Hollywood producers as the American film industry began to take wing in the 30s. He emphasised, first of all, non-roticity. Secondly, pronouncing the T in bottle and water as a T instead of the colloquial D, bottle, water. And thirdly, the unvoiced WH in where, as opposed to the voiced W in where, and called this kind of English World English. Actors from all over the world were, after all, involved in the American movie industry, which now also had a global audience. His pupil and follower, Edith Skinner, later published a book called Good Speech, which was used as a guide for film acting. Skinner taught at Juilliard and coached stage actors before moving to California. Catherine Hepburn adopted her method and became famous for it. Here's an example from the film Break of Hearts from 1935. Isn't it funny, thinking back of all the people you've known? Well, I don't know. You see, I haven't known very many. No? Mm -hmm. Not even in that place you came from? What did you say the name was? North Calvert, Wisconsin. Oh, North Calvert, Wisconsin. Didn't you know any boys there? Oh, of course. I knew them all. Anyone special? Yes, there was, there was Homer Davenport. His father owned the hardware store. Oh, really? And what happened? Nothing, really. No? Why not? Well, because of my music. His family said that if we were married, I'd have to give it up. Did they? Yes, you see, his mother thought that I played nicely enough already. Imagine playing nicely. British film actors adopted the mid-Atlantic accent too. For instance, Vivian Lee, famous for the blockbuster Gone with the Wind. Here's a recording of her acceptance speech from the Oscar ceremony in 1939. Ladies and gentlemen, please forgive me if my words are inadequate in thanking you for your very great kindness. If I were to mention all those who've shown me such wonderful generosity through Gone with the Wind, I should have to entertain you with an oration as long as Gone with the Wind itself. So, if I may, I should like to devote my thanks on this occasion to that composite figure of energy, courage, and very great kindness, in whom all points have gone with the wind meet, Mr. David Selznick. And here she is 20 years later, reverting to her natural British accent. I am absolutely, positively, no good at making speeches. And so I don't intend to make one, but I do very much want to say that I shall never in all my life forget the welcome back that I've been given on this occasion. I shall remember it always with the profoundest, deepest gratitude. We can say that the mid-Atlantic accent had its heyday in the 1930s and 40s and then began to decline. Audiences began to feel that the accent was unnatural and affected, which to some extent it was. Actors like Humphrey Bogart and James Stewart started speaking with their own natural accents, and the style of movies also began to change, with subject matter reflecting the lives of ordinary people with their own ordinary speech patterns. Nowadays, we hear the mid-Atlantic accent from actors affecting an upper-class background, like Kelsey Grammer as Sideshow Bob in The Simpsons. Bart, any last requests? Well... I was wondering if you could sing the entire score of the HMS Pinafore. Very well, Bart. I shall send you to heaven before I send you to hell. Or sinister characters like Darth Vader in Star Wars, portrayed by the American actor James Earl Jones. Your Jack so surprised, Your Highness. You weren't on any mercy mission this time. Several transmissions were beamed to the ship by rebel spies. I want to know what happened to the plans they sent you. 
I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic mission to Alderaan. You are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away! I have traced the rebel spies to her. Now she is my only link to finding their secret base. She'll die before she'll tell you anything. Leave that to me. To sum up, the mid-Atlantic accent was a cultivated way of speaking developed as the movie industry moved from silent film to talking pictures, as a standardized kind of English for film and stage. The phonetic disciplines involved were part of elocution training good then for actors and good now for singers. Most of the texts in classical music are elevated. We seldom sing non-poetic English. On the rare occasions when we do, then consider using colloquial English, either of the British or the American variety. Otherwise, take Mid-Atlantic as your basis. I'll sign off with another extract from Star Wars. Here's Natalie Portman, as the Princess Amidala. Please don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. I will not defer. I've come before you to resolve this attack on our sovereignty now. I was not elected to watch my people suffer and die while you discuss this invasion in a committee.